Professor Freeman, uh, thank you for talking to us and welcome to Thessaloniki and to the conference. Um, I would like to get straight to the point, if you don't mind, and ask you how bleak is the future for human workers? Oh, I don't think it's bleak. It's just that we have to adjust to the machines that will be coming and we have to have some ownership over the machines that it not be that the machines, robots, artificial intelligence, etc., be owned by a small number of uh, billionaires, or someday they'll be trillionaires. Mm -hmm. the, the, this creation of, of, of humanity has to be uh, used for the benefit of, of everyone. And how do you propose this happens? The billionaires and trillionaires that you've mentioned already hold a lot of the power. So how can we move to a collective ownership that, uh, I don't know about the US, but especially in Europe, isn't something that is uh, dominant at the moment? Well, we, we, to move to collective ownership has to start with workers inside a particular company where it often pays the company to spread ownership or profit sharing among workers. That stimulates them to do more things. And remember, most production nowadays is done through teamwork activities. It's not done by one great uh, person sitting up at the top. The, the person may own things, but he or she has to rely upon on many experts inside their companies and so on. And, and the very best companies that we have in the, in the world today uh, certainly in the U.S., uh, have some form of profit sharing or employee ownership. You can't get smart uh, young people to join a company without knowing that they have shares in the company and, uh, and appreciating that when they do good work, indeed they get more than just the base salary that they will be making. So I think there's an economic perspective that says this can occur and will occur. And then, obviously, countries can do things to ease this path. And that's, that's where the policy of, of the EU or particular member countries can play a role. Robotization, as you said, is already a fact. But how long before we see lawyers, doctors, welders or waiters being replaced by machines on a massive scale? Well, I, I would guess 25 to 50 years from now, we will see uh, massive changes. I've used the word replaced, and as long as we have a, a lot of demand for labor, and the economies are booming, and we don't have austerity policies that squeeze countries, there will be jobs for people. There may be fewer, uh, say, lawyers, because the, the uh, legal assistants and machines will do a lot of their work. In the U.S. right now, we're seeing a glut of lawyers coming. People don't, no longer want to go to law school as much as they did because they do see jobs uh, getting worse. But there will be still people who will be programming the computers and people who will be doing other activities working with the machines. Whenever these machines come about, they, it, it's up to people to adjust their skills uh, to, to the, new, the new machinery. And, uh, and obviously, if you build machines that are more complementary and work with people, you may indeed be, have your better sales of your machines. So our best hope is to be able to work with the machines. And to do that, what kind of skills do we need? Well, I think we, we have to learn uh, skills of, uh, first of all, People need program, basic programming skills, understanding of what machines can do uh, 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 and how to use them. And that should start very early in people's education. Because I suppose it, it does, the children are playing with robotic toy, with little, we're using the word robot, robots very wi widely, but little toys that are clearly have some artificial intelligence built into them. And so it isn't just playing with them, it's, it's learning, oh, why are they doing that? How do you get them to do this? So you, you, you view the machines as tools that you can make use of. It seems to me that's, that's a very important part. 
And what is that going to do to human interaction, Professor? Not only on a work uh, level, but also on a personal relationship level. That's, that's a fascinating question. We know that Japanese are trying to build these, quote, soft skill robots, which to minimize human in interactions in some sense. And they have sex robots and you know, different ways that uh, you can interact with a machine. I personally think for a very long time, uh, you and I talking to each other will generate more interesting ideas and interactions than either of us being a robot. Mm -hmm. And that when they finally, when, if and when they can build robots that also get more interactions, then we people will have a problem of all this. Because you could imagine, I just live in my house, I have all kinds of robot assistants, they interact with me, but ultimately I'm the master. And that would create a very different kind of person than I have to adjust to your preferences and to your tastes. Uh, but that's uh, sufficiently far in the future uh, that I, I, I wouldn't worry about that uh, because you know, we have so many problems uh, today in the world, the global warming, the terrorism, Etc. There's a lot of work to be done by people and, and a lot of work uh, to be done by the machines, hopefully helping us. So would you prefer the world that you've just described to me or the world as it is today? In one sense, I, what, I, what I prefer is irrelevant. It's, the, it's what kind of world we're going to be in. So if I preferred uh, you know, sitting on a mountain, uh, being a hermit uh, or something like that, that's kind of not part of the world we're going to be in. So I, I, I don't worry too much about what I prefer. It's, it's where we're going and, and how we can best adjust to it. Well, thank you very much for talking to us. That was very interesting indeed. Thank you so far. This conference has been fascinating with the different perspectives. And uh, yes, really interesting. Thank you.